He is the director of the film The Redeem Team, which tells the story of the 2008 men's basketball team's journey to win the gold medal, which will stream on Netflix October 7th. We welcome back John Weinbach onto Hoopsology. How's it going, John? Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming back to the show. Really appreciate it. Really excited to talk about this new, this new film you have coming up. Because I, I remember this time specifically, not only in the world of basketball, but sports in general. So the first question I want to ask you, just setting the tone for the story of, this, of the 2008 men's Olympic basketball team, can you kind of set the tone in terms of 2004 during that Olympics in terms of they won the bronze medal, but kind of in the basketball world that's considered absolute failure. Can you kind of chase the journey of that team to 2008 and what the pressure was mounting on that 2008 team to redeem, you know, <laughs> the title of the movie, redeem kind of, yeah. you know, U.S. men's basketball team in a whole. Well, look, I think you can go even further back. I mean, the, the reality is, is when you play basketball for the United States on the international stage, you're expected not just to win, to be perfect. And then Coach K says it in our film, you know, when you play for the U.S. team, you're expected to be perfect. Think about that. I mean, that's a yeah. quite different bar than just winning a championship. You cannot lose, you know? And so, you know, up until basically 1988, you know, every Olympics there had been basketball, with the exception of one, which we cover in our film as well, in 1972, every single other Olympics that we participated, we won gold. And then in 88, it changed. The Soviets beat a team of college players. And that was the first sort of awakening. And then we sent, you know, then became the era of the dream team and send me NBA players and we dominated. And then by 2000, really two was the first other big wake up call, which we actually don't follow in the film, but we finished, the United States finished seventh at the world championships, mm -hmm. lost to wow. Argentina, lost to Yugoslavia, yeah. lost to Spain. Um, and so it was like, okay, we got to get our act together for 2004, but we didn't really change anything. And I think some, some, some elements in the world changed not just in basketball but it was a sort of an uncertain time for the united states in the world it's yeah. launched these wars in iraq and afghanistan there was a sense that we were sort of an unwelcome guest in the world and there was fears of terrorism and and sort of the bloom was off the rose to play for the united states i mean if you can only if, if all you can do is be blamed for not winning enough that's not very it's not a very appealing thing to play for so that leads into 04 and we to put it mildly get our asses kicked in 04 and so <clears throat> that created this whole, you know, wake up call to, we have to re-examine the, not just the, the, the way the team plays, but maybe the culture of Team USA basketball. And so that was when Coach K was brought in. That was when Jerry Colangelo assumed control of the national team program. And it became a program, not just a group of guys brought together for a couple of weeks before the Olympics and roll the balls out and win a gold medal. And so all of that context, the history of U.S. basketball on the international stage, the, speci the specificity of what America was going through at that time, the specificity of the challenges to American basketball internationally, playing the playing a role in hey, what are they redeeming? It's not just that they had uh, they lost and they had to win again. It was all of those elements, and then add to that sort of specific arcs for the guys on that team, whether it was LeBron, whether it was Dwayne Wade, whether it was Kobe, whether it was Carmelo, Coach K, Colangelo, even Doug Collins, yeah. you know, comes around. You brought up Kobe, and I think one of the more, more profound things about the film is Kobe's influence on that team in so many levels. Just doing your research and just conducting the interviews, the other players, you know, Carmelo, Dwayne Wade, LeBron, does Kika give context to how they viewed Kobe, not only as just a teammate, but just kind of like almost like, I, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of like a borderline godlike figure. Like, it's just revered, like so much, like he's so respected and everything. I think there's a scene in terms of when they're playing Spain and the, the first play of the game is, you know, Kobe running through Pau Gasol, like destroying him. Um, and the other players being like, man, I didn't know he was going to do that. And LeBron saying, man, we're going to destroy Spain now. Just seeing that play. They just The respect level is different with Kobe than anybody else on that team. Can you kind of sit at the stage of like what, what that was like, you know, doing your research in terms of Kobe's influence? Yeah, I mean, you have to also remember the time period we're talking about, right? Yeah. So all of those guys, it was a primary, uh, predominantly very young team, yeah. right? So, you know, LeBron, Dwayne Wade, and Carmelo all are in the same draft class. Chris Paul's a little bit younger. Chris Bosh, I think, might also be that same class or a little bit younger. 
And so um, it was a, pre- a predominantly young team. And it wasn't like Kobe was old, but he was, sure. you know, yeah. he was 30 in 2008. And he was, uh, you know, some might argue unquestionably, but probably the unquestionably the best player in the NBA, but really at a remove from not only his own teammates on the Lakers, but really kind of from some of those other guys who were his, you know, talent contemporaries. And um, so when they, when the decision was made to bring him in, you know, it was a huge thing in terms of, Hey, could this work? Could, could Kobe coexist well with these guys? Would they accept him? Would he accept them? The answer obviously was a resounding yes, but, but it's a kind of a fascinating portrait in team building and ego management and how do you create a shared agenda for people who may not have one. And, um, and I think, you know, godlike figure, I certainly big brother, Death certainly Baker. taskmaster, certainly team captain. I think all of those uh, labels apply. Um, and, you know, um, that's, that is really, uh, you're not wrong. I mean, obviously we felt an enormous responsibility to, to tell the story well um, and to, to, you know, show that impact, which was real and really, you know, meaningful. And just want to ask you, just with conducting your interviews, I, I noticed after that 2008 Olympics, just the work ethic of a lot of those players. I think they said like their work ethic changed after seeing Kobe. Um, did you get any specific anecdotes in terms of just seeing how Kobe prepared his this you know his workout routines? Like anything, any kind of personal stories that you were talking to the the teammates of Kobe that they picked up that they carry on in, even to this day after that Olympics. Well, I think they, they called it the Breakfast Club, right? Which was in, in Vegas when they would they have their sort of almost quarantine, not quarantine, but they were sort of all together for almost a month um, every summer, 06, 07, 08, uh, in preparation for the Olympics. And, you know, there's a great section in the film, or I think it's a, it's a great section of the film where the guys are coming back from like a night in the clubs in Vegas and they walk in the hotel and who's there at like five in the morning? Kobe in his workout gear. Um, and Kobe was... A, brilliant in, in 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 so many ways but you know in that he understood what it meant for these guys to see him that way whether they were going to be with him was on their terms but he won he was going to do it and is that classic you know showing by example and i think more than anything that set in motion or that you know set this the model the template for going to play for the united states national team you know Kobe's not, it's not, Kobe's there at five in the morning. Well, if Kobe's there at five in the morning, well, I got to be there at five in the morning. And so, you know, there's nothing like, we all kind of have our elders, you know, when you're a freshman in high school, you look sure. at the senior who's a captain and you're like, oh my God, whatever he does, I'm going to do. And so that dynamic was at play and you, you couldn't pull any BS because yeah. that guy's not going to stand for it. Um, and so that set a model for how a team of superstars is going to work. And so that that is, I think, the, the big, biggest thing they all took from it. It was just like, hey, if Kobe's doing it, I got to be in there doing it too. What surprised you about making this film? What, in terms of before you you got into the planning stages to when you were uh, making just making this documentary, was there anything that really surprised you? You're like, man, I was not expecting that when you were conducting your interviews. Um, you know, I don't want to say I'm surprised at. At, at the, you know, grace, humor, emotion, I was just, it was so rewarding as a someone who do, does this for a living and who loves sports and loves storytelling and, uh, you know, enjoy the interview process. You know, I would say the grace, candor, humor, authenticity, emotion, affection for this topic that each of these guys had almost without exception, um, was really surprising. I mean, like I said, surprising is almost the wrong word. Uh, just rewarding. I think on the surprising thing is just some of the footage discoveries. I mean, some of these elements had been, uh, some of the elements had never before seen, but some have been seen but overlooked and sort of only available if you hunt and peck on YouTube. And I think getting some of the raw footage of Coach K was a real joyful surprise because, you know, he can be profane, he can be funny, he can be self-deprecating. Um, and you don't always 
you know, get that because Coach K is, you know, this icon of he's like the modern day, not like he's the modern day, you know, John Wooden. Sure. Um, and, you know, I would say on his interview, um, the doubts that he expressed about his own ability wow. to, to connect with those guys. He's like, you know, I'd had a lot of success in the college realm, but <laughs> NBA is different, you know. And so, you know, that was in his mind of, hey, I've got to show these guys that I'm not that guy. I'm this guy. And so all of those elements were really, really fascinating and, and why I think, you know, if we've done our job right, uh, what I hope people take away is it's kind of this fascinating portrait of team building. To that point with Coach K, do you know what steps he took when, you know, meeting his, you know, his team for the first time? You just mentioned kind of his apprehension. Was there any kind of additional preparation that he took to kind of create that that bond between him and, you know, his team sort of speaks. I think all those guys, I mean, they have such a huge respect for Coach K even before they got on the team, but still, you know, there's a melding of personalities that has to take place. So did Coach K um, kind of take any unusual steps that he wouldn't take normally at Duke to kind of, you know, increase that camaraderie, so to speak? I can't speak to what he did differently from what he does at Duke or did at Duke, but sure. um, I think, you know, it would have been, I think, a very different dynamic if Coach K had been the coach of the dream team. Sure. Because – the dream team players, I don't know that that would have worked with them because they are all came of age at a time before they knew Coach K as Coach K. All of the guys, remember Kobe had been recruited by Coach K. Yeah. And so he was going to go to Duke had he not gone pro. So all of the guys on the redeem team, they knew Coach K as the champion, as this guy. So in a certain kind of way, he was Switzerland. You know, he wasn't an NBA coach who might have an agenda and didn't like a guy because of a playoff series. So he, he could operate clean in that kind of way. But, you know, I think he's a winner for a reason, you know, master motivator. And I think that he's he is who he is. You know, he's a child of immigrants. He's a guy who went to West Point and he served in the military you know, he, and, and, and played point guard for the army, you know, and so when it could easily come off as super cheesy and false, bringing in army guys, yeah. you know, who there's maybe no organic connection to the players, but it's coach K and, and, and he, he lived that and he knew those guys. And so, and, and, you know, when it comes to patriotism, you know, that, that was a real thing for him. This was, a, like I said, you know, I think it's either child or grandchild of immigrants. And, um, you know, his name is his name. People don't know how to pronounce his name. It's a very kind of uniquely American experience. And so um, all of those things, I think, worked. And I think from a spe specific motivational thing, he was there to say, hey, look, we can't be arrogant. We, the United States, we literally to the language of it. Stop calling it our game. It's not our game. Yeah. It's the true. world's game. Sure. You know, how many times have we heard that oh, it's our game and we're the Americans and you know it's our game? No, it's not. The game was invented by a Canadian and it's played all over the world. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so um, the you know that all those things were very authentic and I think worked because you know he had legitimacy from a certain point of view, but also it didn't come off as artificial. Um, I want to ask you about uh, LeBron, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh, and um, it was. It's it's been widely known that the Redeem team has been one of the catalysts in terms of the uh, big three forming in Miami. Can you kind of um, tell us, just we've checking out the footage, just, did you see the signs of chemistry between the two of them, like their bond forming in terms of carrying that success that they had from the Olympics into the NBA? Um, well, there's no direct connection <clears throat> between the, the Beijing success and the banana boats of Miami. <laughs> um, I mean, Yes, was it a formative experience for them? Of course. I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, and I asked Dwayne Wade about this and, and Chris as well, <clears throat> it wasn't like they were plotting in the rooms of Beijing. Okay, in two <laughs> years, we're going to sign together and go to Miami. I mean, I think that's sort of fanciful thinking. Um, but I think, you know, all things have an, ha have an impact. And when you have a really transformative experience with anyone together and then you're later presented with an opportunity to repeat that well you're going to be more likely to do it so i think did it make it happen no in other words did did the beijing experience literally make the miami heat you know 
super team happen? No. Did it contribute to it because it gave all these guys a really nice feeling inside about playing with one another? Of course. But I don't think there was, they were not plotting in Beijing to re up with Miami in two years. Gotcha. It just wasn't some kind of big master plan. No, there was no like master plan. Yeah. (laughs) Um, one more question for you. We were talking about Kobe earlier, and I think this is very interesting because his influence in China is is massive. He, he's such an icon over there. Did you discover just um, while while making the film, just you know, the you know China, of course, is going to root for their team, but at the same time, they revere Kobe so much. So, what was kind of that dynamic? Did you discover anything with the Chinese fans in terms of maybe their loyalties being split? You know, you know, in terms of you know, when they played or. You know, look, I, the the one of the interesting things, just again, you know, passage of time um, with the film is, you know, what a different world we live in, right? Yeah. I mean, the 2008 Olympics were like the big coming out party for China and like yes. opening their arms to the world, right? Couldn't be more different from the way we are now. And, and so that was kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, as to why Kobe was so big in China, you know, I don't know the market specifics. I mean, I think it had to do with he was going to China just earlier than some of the other guys with Nike, even I think as far back as when he was still with Adidas. So there was the, that connectivity and he was a champion. I mean, I, I don't know the individual. Why was he so much bigger than LeBron or whatever? I mean, it had a lot to do with winning. Sure. And um, and his shoe and the way the efforts that Nike made and, and Kobe's, you know, um, you know, just the the champion mentality, but you know, he was clearly massive, you know, there. And, and there's a really, you know, I think Dwayne Wade says, he goes, you know, when you're with the Olympic team, you know, it's a big deal. Like some players are more popular than others, but you know, we're the Olympic team. Like when we got to China, it was Kobe, Kobe, Kobe. <laughs> and, and it's interesting. I, as this Olympics project, we, we uh, Olympic series was telling you about, um, we had done several films with the IOC, one of which was on a Chinese volleyball icon. And, and when we did interviewed her, she said, "You know, who's bigger bigger than any than my, anyone, even bigger than Michael Jordan, it was Kobe." Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, I don't know, it, it, I don't know what the dynamics were there, but he was massively popular. John, thank you very much for joining the show. Really appreciate it. Please let our viewers and listeners know where you can find you on social media. Um, again, when the film comes out, any other upcoming projects as well that you want to plug. Also, thank you. Um, well. Uh, our, uh, I'm now the president of Skydance Sports. Uh, we're very excited about a series coming to Amazon, to Prime Video in November on the U.S.-Mexico soccer rivalry oh, cool. um, called Good Neighbors. Um, and we will have a feature film inspired by actually a, a documentary that I co-directed on Sonny Vaquero called Soul Man, but it's going to be a feature film. Don't know the title yet, but it's going to be on the origin story of the Air Jordan brand, oh, uh, directed by Ben Affleck, starring Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, Viola Davis, uh, and Jason Bateman. Very exciting. And uh, social, I'm at John Weinbach on Twitter, J-O-N-W-E-I-N-B-A-C-H, and Instagram at J-B Weinbach, J-B Weinbach, W-E-I-N-B-A-C-H. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Thanks very much, John. Really appreciate it.